So Joyce Myers uh, recently came out and renounced uh, the prosperity gospel. Uh, she did this a few weeks after Benny Hinn renounced it. Her statement, I'm going to read to you in a minute, is a little different. Benny renounced the wealth part of the health and wealth gospel. She renounced the health part. He renounced the wealth. She renounced the health. And I'm going to explain to you what I mean by that. But, um, and I'm going to give you scriptures to show you what the church, the ancient church, the first century church, the Catholic church, has taught since the beginning on, these subject, on this subject. So, first a little background on Joyce Myers, a mega church pastor, been preaching for at least 30 years, you know, like Benny, you know, 30 to some odd years. Um, so, um, a few years back, Chuck Grassley... Uh, and a group of senators investigated her, Benny Hinn, and a few, I forget a few other uh, of these mega church pastors because of their elaborate lifestyle it was just so ridiculous. Now, I'm a freedom loving American. I really feel uncomfortable about the government interfering with the church. Uh, there's a separation of church and state uh, to protect the church from the state, not vice versa. Uh, so, um, I really don't like when the government gets involved with the church in this matter, but if someone's breaking the law, like recently Tom Kuntz, another mega uh, church pastor, went to jail for tax evasion, another word of faith guy that worth millions and uh, he's sitting in jail right now. And uh, Robert Tilton went to jail for fraud. These are actual crimes. Uh, you know, it's not a crime if a Christian wants to give you his last paycheck so you can live in a two million dollar home like Joyce Meyer lives in. So I mean, I think it's wrong, and I think these people are going to be judged by God. But I don't want the government telling people they can't do something with their money that they want to do. But I mean, Robert Tilton, he deserves to be in jail. It was fraud. He would literally, uh, I think I told you this in another video, he literally would have an earpiece and work with one of his ushers who got a prayer card, and the prayer card would say, I'm, you know, I got diagnosed you know, with cancer, blah, blah, blah. And he would say, someone in the third row was diagnosed with cancer. I mean, it was, it was a total fraud scam, and uh, he went to jail for that. But he's back out preaching, and people are still giving him money. Go figure. But Joyce Myers was investigated, and she was cleared. I mean, what she was doing... Uh, biblically, it's unbiblical, and ethically and morally it's wrong, but she committed no crime. She paid, you know, the taxes were all online. But one of the things they found that was a little sketchy is she wrote off a, uh, a toilet bowl. I'm not even kidding. She had a customized, everything she had in her house, you know, she was living like a rock star. Everything was customized. She had a two, I'm sorry, a $30,000 toilet bowl made of solid marble with 24 karat gold uh, flusher. I, you know, I guess her, she thought her poop didn't stink or something. <laughs> but, uh, but that was one of the items that Grassley and the other senators questioned. And uh, Anyway, she was cleared. She, she didn't do anything illegal. Immoral in my view, yes, but illegal. But now, getting back to recent history, what she said, and I'm gonna give you my opinion as a evangelical, you know, former evangelical, 20 something years, almost 30 years, and you know, I had a lot of friends in the Word of Faith movement. I went to a lot of these churches uh, as a guest, you know, never really got into it, you know, would show my friends the scriptures why I thought they were wrong, uh, you know, when I was an evangelical. But I'm going to tell you why I think they're all coming out and there's going to be more. I predict there's going to be more in the distant future, and I'll tell you why. But let me get to what she actually said. I guess she posted it on Instagram. Every time somebody had a problem in their life, I thought it's because they didn't have enough faith. If you got sick, it's because you don't have enough faith. If your child died, it's because you didn't have enough faith. This is what these people believe. It's very sad. So just think about that. What kind of bondage they put their followers in. These people think every time they get sick or their child gets sick, it's their fault. Because they didn't have enough faith. I mean, you're talking about a very legalistic works-oriented system that you you got to earn God's blessing you got to earn God's grace you got to earn 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 by your faith and they, their faith was in faith their faith was in their own faith where true faith you have faith in God you have faith in his grace that whatever happens 
It's God's will. Not my will be done, but your will be done. I mean, I literally, I met a pastor's wife. It was so sad. Uh, when I was in Jersey, it's gone back like, I don't know, 30 some odd years, maybe 30, no, not that long, 20 something years ago. I used to sell copier machines, you know, door to door and knock on doors and sell copier machines. And um, his church had contacted us because uh, they had a copier. They were, they were actually, they were looking, I think they were looking for a donation or something. I forget exactly. Uh, but I went and visited them. And this poor woman, she's like in her 60s. And she said her husband had just died of a heart attack. He was the pastor of this church. She said he started the church like 30 years ago. And it was a, it was a vibrant church. And he was having chest pains. And they called the elders of the church. And they prayed for him. And uh, she was like, well, maybe we should go to uh, the hospital or call 911. He's like, no, I got faith. I'm not. No, you know, he felt like it would be a sin. Like, you know. And uh, he died of a heart attack that night. And most people in that church, instead of repenting of this false teaching, they left because they were like, wow, that pastor didn't have enough faith. His wife and then his, his son took over the pastorate. That's what happens in a lot of these man-made churches. And um, so I explained to the woman the grace of God. You know, I read her uh, Galatians 3.1, where Paul says, you foolish Galatians, you started out in the Spirit. What makes you think you can gain God's favor with uh, your flesh? And, and that's what it was. It, the book of Galatians talks about, you know, the grace of God and how, you know, it's God that blesses us. It's not us. It's not our faith. Okay? Now, of course we need faith, but the faith of a mustard seed can move a mountain. But just like Jesus said, not my will be done, your will be done. So yeah, we have faith and we believe that God can do miracles and God can do healings. But we know the ultimate decision is God's. It's not our faith. He's not a genie that we can direct. And this is what this Word of Faith movement did. And it brought on so much anguish to this, this woman. She was just so broken. She didn't understand. She thought that her faith was broken. And, and as a side note, she asked me if I would come in and preach because her son's kind of shy. And he's been preaching to about ten people. And I said, I've never been to seminary. I said, I'm basically, I'm a high school dropout. <laughs> and uh, she said, that's okay. So was my husband. He never went to seminary either. And I said, you know, that's part of the problem in evangelical circles. They just, you want to start a church, you could just start a church. And, you know, you know there's some great guys like A.W. Tozer, who's a great um, Christian. You know, he died, you know, he's, I think he was, died maybe 50 years ago or what, 100 years ago. I don't know. But A.W. Tozer wrote tons of books and he was very bright Christian who understood the scriptures very well, but, and he wasn't educated as well, but they're far, if they're few and far between, usually what happens is someone that's not qualified becomes a pastor, and then they get off in these false teachings, like the Word of Faith movement, you know, that guy wasn't a scoundrel, to, you know, saying something he didn't believe to get people to give to him, uh, like a lot of these Word of Faith guys are, he really believed it. He was, he was deceived by other teachers because he, he wasn't grounded in the scriptures and church history and, and he didn't know. So that, I see that happening a lot in the Word of Faith movement. But um, the reason I think they're all coming, like Joyce Myers came out and I think a lot more are going to come out, is because just like a smart politician gets out in front of the story, like if a politician knows a scandal is going to break about him, they'll bring it out first and keep talking about it and talking about it and say, yeah, I'm sorry. You know, because they know people are forgiven. Uh, but if you get caught in this scandal, then people are less forgiven. And I think because Benny Hinn's grandson wrote this book about the Word of Faith movement, they're getting nervous that people related to them are going to start coming out. And eventually, like a lot of these fads within Protestantism, you know, they're around for 50, 60 years, and they run their course, and people realize that was silly. And this, this, this Word of Faith movement's been around probably 50 years now. So I think it's running its course. People, you know, especially with the Internet and there's so much information, Christians are, are uh, being a little more educated within evangelicalism where they can s see a false prophet a mile away. And speaking of false prophets, uh, this, this is interesting. As I was researching this, I came across, well, I remembered and I looked it up, the Didact. The Didact was, a, uh, was like the catechism in the first century. Um, it dates back to like 50 AD when the apostles were still alive. And it's uh, written, we don't know who the authors are, uh, 
but the church, the Catholic church, the, the whole church has accepted it. You know, Protestants don't talk about a lot of old stuff anymore, but it's never been refuted as, oh, this is false. Everyone thought, it, you know, it's not scriptural. It's not inspired by God, but just like uh, the church has a catechism to teach uh, its Christians, new Christians, you know, we, we teach them. That's what this is, like a first century catechism. And concerning uh, teachers, apostles, and prophets, it says this. Whosoever therefore comes and teaches you all these things that have been said before, receive him. But if the teacher himself turn and teach another doctrine, like the Word of Faith movement, to the destruction of this, hear him not. But if he teaches so as to increase righteousness and the knowledge of the Lord, receive him as you would the Lord. But concerning the apostles and prophets, according to the decree of the gospel, thus do. Let every apostle that comes to you be received as the Lord, but he shall not re remain except one day. But if there is a need, if, if, if there need be, also the next day. But if he remains three days, he's a false prophet. And when the apostle goes away, let him take nothing but bread until he lodges. But if he asks for money, he is a false prophet. So this is 50 AD, the Christians were being taught. If someone asks you for money and says he's a prophet or an apostle, he's false. So this is what the church has taught from the beginning. And even in the scriptures, um, now I, I got off. I got off of um, the health and went on the wealth. But I'm gonna bring you back to the to the health. And I mean, you could suffer with. Uh, I'm gonna talk about suffering, and you could suffer financially. But usually, when we talk about suffering, it's, it's physically. I mean, if you don't have your health, what are you gonna do with wealth? Health is wealth. Okay, but but why do we suffer? What I was able to share with that. Uh, pastor's widow was all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and my evangelicalism you know they taught me a lot of good scriptures and a lot they gave me a good base in, in the scriptures and like I said in many of my videos I don't renounce anything that I was taught there I just grew deeper in the faith and I found the deeper I went the more Catholic I became and um, and when it comes to suffering there's a lot of good teaching within evangelicalism, but they never get as deep as the ancient church, as that first century church, as the Catholic church has such powerful teaching on suffering that I'm going to share with you today in, in, out of the scriptures. Um, but like I shared with that woman, you know, sometimes God allows bad things so you can help others. Now you're suffering so you can you can share what you're learning about God's grace and it's not faith in faith it's faith in God and whatever his will is okay so if you want to turn with me in the scriptures I'm gonna turn first to 2nd Corinthians chapter 1 uh, verses 3 through 6 this is 2nd Corinthians chapter 1 3 to 6 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. Why? So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. So these Word of Faith guys are missing out on this blessing, this teaching, that God allows us to suffer. He could, he could stop all suffering in it with a word, but He allows our suffering... So through our suffering, we can receive the comfort from God. So when we see other people suffering, we can comfort them with the comfort that we receive from Christ Himself. How can you comfort someone if you have no idea what their experience? That's why Jesus Christ became a man. Why God Almighty stepped down on earth and became a man. So He can feel what we feel emotionally, being betrayed by the closest people to Him, physically suffering the most torturous death. He knows how to comfort us. Because he was comforted by God the Father while he was here on earth. And now when we suffer, we're comforted by God the Son. So we can comfort others. 
I mean, what a blessing this is. What, what a deep teaching. But it gets even deeper than that. And, and the next verse I'm going to read, I don't ever remember reading as an evangelical. And I had some good, solid Bible teachers that would teach verse by verse through the whole Bible. And I don't know if they just glossed over this or I don't remember this teaching. So I'm going to share it with you. And, th and this is a powerful Catholic teaching. And I hope I get it right because it's so deep. Sometimes it's hard to grasp. But once you grasp it, and I grasp it in my spirit, but sometimes my mind, it's hard for me to put it into words. So I'll, I'll read the scriptures and let them minister to you. And then I'll explain to you what the church has always taught to the best of my ability. Okay, so it's um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Talking to the church. And in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. And it's a hard verse for evangelicals because they're like, nothing's, nothing's lacking in Christ's afflictions. Nothing is lacking in his affliction on the cross. His, what he did on the cross was complete. The once and lifetime, once and ever sacrifice on the cross is complete. Jesus said, it is finished. It is complete. What he did on the cross was not lacking anything for our salvation. What the church has always taught, and if you study that scripture, what St. Paul is saying is that God allows us, as a mystical body of Christ, to suffer. That is what's lacking. Me suffering as a part of Christ's mystical body, his supernatural body. If you're an evangelical, you know we're the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. Whether you're a Catholic Christian or an evangelical Christian, you're part of the body of Christ. And what's lacking is our suffering. And then according to church, what the church has taught from the very beginning is when we suffer, we can offer that suffering. We can join it with Christ's suffering. Not only do we, you know, all, a lot of Christians want to talk about the joy of Christ and it's there. If you're a Christian, you have joy. And, and the spiritual blessings of being joined with Christ. But if you want to be a follower of Christ, not only do you got to pick up your cross and follow Him, you have to suffer with Him. And you join when you join His suffering, it's not a waste. See, most people think when they're suffering, it's just a waste. And okay, well, maybe it'll do me some good. You know, it'll bring me closer to God. And I look back and I thank God for my suffering. And this is all good. This is what I learned as an evangelical. And this is great teaching that I suffered for a reason because it brought me, drew me closer to God. Paul's going deeper and saying your suffering can help other Christians spiritually. You can offer up your suffering to Christ for the sake of the church, for the sake of your brother who's suffering. That's why Christians would go to see the saints that were waiting to be eaten by lions. People wanted to touch Polycarp and say, pray for me. And Polycarp would offer his sufferings before he was about to be tortured to death. And St. Ignatius to Antioch, it, it was like a year's walk for this 80-year-old man to to go to the Colosseum and be thrown to the lions. And he willingly, he willingly said, I hope these lions grind my bones in the bread to be one with the bread of Christ, the body of Christ. And he offered his sufferings for the sake of the church. So suffering can be such a spiritual blessing, not only for you, but for your brothers and sisters in the church. And so not only are these Christians that are involved in the Word of Faith movement being stolen of their joy because they're so you know, worried, oh, if I get sick because I didn't have enough faith, and they're always looking at themselves, oh, I'm not doing this right, I'm, I'm not holy enough, I'm not have enough faith, and they're constantly, like it's in a drudgery. And, and, and Jesus said, you know, my burden is light. You know, if someone's putting a heavy burden on you, it's false teaching. Jesus' burden is light. And he who the Son sets free is free indeed. He wants to set you free. There's freedom in Christ. Spiritual freedom. Not freedom to go sin, but freedom to trust that you have a loving Father that sent His only begotten Son to die for you so you may, so you may have eternal life with Him. And when we suffer, it's not a punishment. The suffering is a blessing. So we can join 
our suffering to Christ's suffering, and we can truly abide in Christ, and Christ can truly abide in us. And I never got that until I was Catholic. And like so many other things, evangelicalism could take you so far. But to get to where those first century Christians were, these Christians that willingly went to the lions, that it was so real that they were experiencing joy in the midst of their suffering, that that's how they turned the pagan world into a Christian world. These pagans watched as these first century Christians suffered. They didn't win them over by saying, you can have as many camels as you want if you have enough faith. No, they want them over by suffering and enjoying their suffering to Christ's suffering for the sake of the church. So if you're suffering today, join it to Christ's suffering and thank Him for your blessing. God bless you and I hope this was helpful. Bye.